Let's say that you're playing an RPG, and you see an item in the shop for 5 coins. You play for a little bit more, and then you notice that in the shop in the next town over, you can sell that same item for slightly more than you purchased it for. Congratulations, you just found an infinite money exploit. And if you're willing to put the work in, you can run up your coin count and essentially destroy the economy of the game. Infinites can be found in just about any type of game genre. First attack, then regenerate, then draw! Each event triggers the next in a never-ending cycle! But they all share one thing in common. Infinites are, at their core, an oversight, a glitch, or an exploit that can be used by the player to gain an advantage not intended by the developer of a game. In a single-player game, there's actually very little harm in abusing these exploits. Some of them are actually vital in other forms of competitive gaming, like in speedrunning. But in multiplayer games, infinites take a different form. They're a series or a sequence of moves that can combo into each other, imprisoning the opponent in a never-ending state of hit-stun or block-stun. And that represents a big, big problem for these games. Because a good fighting game will get players to thoughtfully consider the types of risks they're taking against the reward that they will get in return, with the best players minimizing their risk for as much reward as they can manage. But in the presence of infinite and 100% damage combos, the calculations get thrown completely out of whack. Because if an infinite is easy enough, there's no reason to not consistently fish for that first hit, no matter the risk, because the reward for landing that hit is literally infinite. But despite the problems that infinites cause, they are and will forever be an inherent part of fighting games, as they are the natural end result of a dedicated player base trying to squeeze every last point of damage from a game's combo mechanics. So in today's video, I'll take a look at infinites in fighting games, where they come from, and how different fighting game communities have dealt with them. If you enjoy this video, please feel free to give me the pleasure of your subscription and to follow on Twitter. Fighting game developers spend a lot of time and effort trying to prevent infinites. When a character you're doing a combo on is suddenly able to block after eating a ton of light hits, or when you can't keep an air combo going because your opponent sinks lower and lower to the ground, that's the invisible hand of the developer trying to rein in their game's combo system in order to facilitate the type of gameplay that they've envisioned in their mind's eye. However, despite the best of intentions, humans and their code are not perfect, meaning that infinites... Uh, find a way. Like how in a November 2019 patch for Mortal Kombat 11, the Thunder God Raiden was in some need of buffs. So Netherrealm made his lightning strike move a little bit better, going from plus 6 to plus 11 frames of advantage on hit. But players were pretty quick to figure out that his standing front punch only started up in 7 frames, meaning that there were about 4 frames that allowed those moves to combo into each other. And because there's no knockback in the corner of a fighting game stage, and the string leading into the lightning strike didn't push Raiden back, you could repeat the loop infinitely. These types of infinites where there's just a gap in frame data happen sometimes, but they're nowhere near as common as infinites where there's just one or two moves that sidestep the rules of the systems that were supposed to keep them in check to begin with. Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 has one such system called hit stun deterioration, meaning that every move you hit the enemy with will cause less and less hit stun. Eventually, the opponent will be able to recover faster than your fastest move, and the match will continue as normal. The only exception to that rule is the knockdown state. And that's special because moves that put characters into a knockdown state don't count towards hit stun deterioration. Thus, the opponent is unable to recover for as long as every move they're hit with from that point forward is a move that causes another knockdown state. Zero, Virgil, Spencer, and a lot of others all have moves that abuse this vulnerability, with almost every single one of them being capable of taking down even the biggest health bars with a single combo. Fighting games are at their best when players are making decisions for themselves and being rewarded or punished for those decisions. A single round in a fighting game is made up of hundreds of decisions, both major and minor, which result in either a round win or a round loss. But if one player manages to pull off a 100% damage combo, all of what I said just goes out the window. 
Once an infinite or TOD begins, there's no more decisions to make, just a bunch of waiting around while what used to be a two player game becomes a one player combo exhibition. Yeah, you could make a phone call, dude. Change the song. Oh, he was looking at his phone. Wow. I mean, hey, what else can you do? <laughs> and that gets to the heart of why the fighting game developers that I've spoken to on the topic despise infinites. Interactivity grinds to a halt and both players stop thinking for the duration of the combo while they go through the motions, resulting in frustration for the victim and an equal amount of boredom for the attacker. In the words of game designer Adam Keats Hart, people quit games because they're either too bored or too frustrated, and infinites breed both of those quit conditions. Thankfully though, because development teams these days are more connected to the pulse of what the peskier players of their games are up to, these exploits get patched pretty soon after they're found. But when a game finishes support, when the final patch is released and there are no more changes to be made, developers leave it in the hands of the community to play the game as they see fit. And if that includes breaking the systems that the developers created, so be it. After all, this lack of developer oversight can sometimes lead to bugs and exploits that can actually deepen a game, expanding attack and defense routes that otherwise wouldn't be seen if the community hadn't been given the chance to explore the engine without boundaries. But when the parents are gone and the children are playing in the yard, there's gotta be some kind of structure so the whole thing doesn't turn into Lord of the Flies. That's why gaming communities will craft rule sets around the systems of their games in order to put everyone on the same level playing field and provide consistency so we're not all stuck playing 10 round games at 30 seconds apiece on the clock. What? He put it to 30 seconds? But these rules are always created with the health of the game in mind. It's the reason why Smash bans items, the reason why you can't play Ivan Ooze, and the reason why you can't use this ruby heart glitch in Marvel 2 without getting punched in the back of the head. I want that damn from the arcade! When bugs, glitches, and infinites step outside of the bounds of healthy gameplay, they become what's known as degenerate, which is a term used to describe an option so oppressive that it invalidates wide swaths of otherwise perfectly good fighting game strategies. Now, it would be easy to say that the best way to take care of this stuff would be to ban it out of existence, but that's not usually the right choice. Like, if you ban an infinite combo that only works under rare conditions or requires perfect spacing or execution to pull off, you may be unintentionally lowering the skill ceiling to a game because you're punishing the player who had the skills to recognize and capitalize on that situation. Now, I want to tell you a bit of a personal story. I was at EVO 2013 in the pit next to the stage during finals day. Man, this is the loser side, man. Look at those wide eyes. Caffeine is in that boy. <laughs> and after an incredible King of Fighters 13 Top 8, I think I was ready to sit down and take a break because Super Smash Bros. Melee was up next. And honestly, I wasn't expecting much other than the usual Fox-only, no-items final destination that I'd come to expect from top-level Melee. But then this guy shows up. And he chooses Ice Climbers? That's no Fox. And then in his match, he proceeds to do this. Having that second ice climber there, and he's oh, got he's it! he's got there it! There it is! We got wobbles in the house! Is this what you wanted from Evo? <laughs> free ice climbers! Free the ice climbers! They are clearly free, as Dr. PB from that grab. I thought to myself, that's the cheapest, dumbest thing I'd ever seen in a fighting game. I love it! That, ladies and gentlemen, is wobbling, and it is my favorite infinite, because the discussion in the Smash community for what to do about wobbling has been going on for longer than a large chunk of Smashers have been alive. If you don't know already, it's an Ice Climbers exclusive infinite that begins off of a grab so you can't block it. It only takes one button and one joystick motion to execute. So how easy is it to do? Okay. I know how to wobble now. Oh yeah, that should totally be banned. This is disgusting. <laughs> yeah, but should it be banned? That's more of a difficult question to answer because on one side, the Ice Climbers get access to infinite damage from something as common as a throw. Because of that, Ice Climbers play at just about every skill level becomes about fishing for that throw, making plenty of other strategies for playing the character obsolete. But on the other hand, even with this infinite, the Ice Climbers don't become god-tier characters. Because Melee is still a 4 stock game, they need to land at least 4 grabs with a sub-par grab range. 
they're still extremely beatable, have never really dominated tournaments, so even though Wobbling is incredibly strong, it's still not strong enough to drag the character to Meta Knight or Bayonetta levels of domination. But why then have so many Smash tournaments in the last two years effectively banned Wobbling anyway? Well, that's because these tournament organizers and a large portion of the Melee community believe that Wobbling is antithetical to the spirit of the game. And if that seems nebulous and ambiguous, that's because it kind of is. Remember, Melee's a game in which its best character has a jump cancelable projectile reflecting attack that's active on frame 1. That's ridiculous and borderline broken, but nobody ever talks about banning it because in the context of Melee, it still fits in with the mechanics of the game. You still need to worry about directional influence, you still need to worry about stage positioning, and you still need to think about your next move when the game goes back to neutral. Whereas if you get grabbed by the Ice Climbers, there ain't nothing you could do about it. The argument to ban Wobbling hinges on the idea that it just turns Melee into a different game played by different rules. Think of it like this. Melee is like basketball, where if you want to make a three-point bucket, you need to work the perimeter and have a good jump shot. Everyone in the game plays by these same rules, but some of them are obviously better at it than others. But then the Ice Climbers come up and they're playing freaking slam ball, which is an offshoot of the same sport, but there's trampolines on the floor and dunks are worth three points. They may look the same, but those two games play completely differently, and they value different skills. Melee tournament organizers just took it upon themselves to say, hey, we think we want our players to play basketball because that's just the set of skills that we deem valid. I think one of the reasons why a wobbling ban is so widely accepted at this point is because the Ice Climbers are the only ones who can do such a strategy. You can pretty easily create an enforceable rule that says that this one character can't do this one thing, but in a hypothetical world where the majority of the melee cast has something like wobbling, then making rules around those techniques becomes so tough that you're either forced to adapt to the game as is or simply play a different game. When that happens, you get the 2005 title Hakuto no Ken or Fist of the North Star for us gaijin out there. It's a niche little fighting game, but if you know anything about it at all, it's probably because you know that it has some of the most ridiculous bonkers infinites in all of fighting game history. But it didn't start out that way. Hakuto no Ken was infamous for its game-breaking bugs and not the fun ones either. Those in combination with one overpowered character who towered over the rest almost caused the game to lose its entire player base just a year after release. But oddly enough, the game was saved by the discovery of even more insane glitches, glitches that led to the discovery of infinites and 100% damage combos that could be used by the entire cast. Hakuto no Ken ended up being sort of like a proto-dive kick in the sense that any stray hit could turn into a kill, which appealed to enough people to give the game a decent-sized cult following. I think this goes to show that there is just no one-size-fits-all approach to banning these kinds of infinites. Every fighting game community has different ideas about the place of infinites in their favorite games, different ideas about how much infinites as well as other bugs and glitches add or subtract to the balance, and that's because there's an ocean of gray area between an infinite that looks like this and an infinite that looks like this. While every infinite combo is a degenerate option, some games are built in a way where they're just broken enough in just the right way that the things that logically cause a game's design to go south are the things that actually enhance their depth and replayability. And to me, there's no better game that fits that bill than Marvel vs. Capcom 2, where between unblockables, guard breaks, double snaps, permanent damage power-ups, and infinite combos, there's an entire ecosystem of degenerate strategies that somehow all combine to create what most people would call The game wasn't defined by a single technique or overbearing strategy because there would always be something just a little bit better that the opponent could do to you. For example, infinites, while very common in Marvel 2, often gave way to resets because the game's damage scaling on long combos meant that you needed to be more consistent in your execution, or else you would drop your combo. And because every character who's worth a damn can kill you in a few bars of meter, which they almost certainly have after you spent the last few minutes trying to kill them, you could end up a single character down off of one mistake. Okay. okay yeah, he should be dead. This should be a dead sentinel. 
That was optimal. So you're trying to get sweet oh, with it. That's what happens when reset. you get sweet. Just get it done. Just get it done. Finish. Now you got to deal with this. That cutthroat, high damage, fast paced gameplay acted as a screen that sifted out the roster from tournament viability, but the presence of infinites and touch of death combos for a large portion of the cast meant that it was never the damage output that determined if they were a good or a bad character. But if you fixed the rest of the things, like if you fixed infinites and you fixed Sentinels Unblockable and the rest of that stuff, like the game would become vastly more unbalanced. Having infinites is what makes Iron Man viable at all. If he could just hit you and do like 30%, you wouldn't be scared of anything, right? Cable would still be able to AHVB everybody to death. Storm Scent would still be able to do the DHC that kills you. And even if you fix that, Sentinel just hitting you does like 60% damage with basic launch 1, 2, 3, 4 rocket punch. You don't fix a game by nerfing the heck out of the stuff that's good unless it is to the point of being broken. You fix a game by giving all the characters that don't have options in situations, options in those situations. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 is a game with so many tiny little nuances and brand new innovations to the fighting game genre that when you couple it with a staggering amount of bugs, infinites, and borderline broken techniques, it seems like a miracle that what came out on the other side was one of the most iconic fighting games to ever grace arcades. So if you haven't guessed it by now, I'm actually a really big fan of the infinite combo. Uh, while they do propagate an unhealthy gameplay loop in fighting games, the fact that they exist at all means that there's a certain type of freedom in a game's combo mechanics, and an ingenuity on behalf of the game players who are trying to maximize that engine. So if you don't mind, I would like to see your favorite infinites in fighting games. Leave them in the comments below. Um, I would like to take this opportunity now to thank a few uh, um, people who helped me on this video. So I'm going to go ahead and finish up here, and then uh, my fiance wants to play some Super Smash Bros. Melee with me. I uh, hear she's been working on her ice climbers. See how that turns out. <laughs>